Hello again. This is uh, week four, lecture one, part two. Uh, picking up where we left off, and if memory serves, which um, I hope it does because it wasn't that long ago. Um, I mean, I did post lecture one, uh, part one first, and then, but that takes a little while. But then I'm back, so half hour later or so. Um, Memory serves. We left off having discussed uh, Wittenberg theology and spreading the word and getting uh, Melanchthon involved and explaining humanism and Melanchthon's role in, in Wittenberg, um, at least early on, um, and Karl Stotz as well. Um, and the movement is spreading, and word is getting out, and it's spreading by word of mouth. It's also spreading by a new technology namely printing. And I think I mentioned too that one of the things that made the 95 Theses, let's say the start of Luther's movement beyond Luther and the start of the Reformation as a, a, a movement beyond the individual development of Luther, was that the 95 Theses were translated and printed and spread throughout the empire. That was not possible 100 years previous. Now, I think I talked about um, in earlier lectures the Reformation of the, of the later Middle Ages and how that did not really bring about a Reformation. And in some ways, you could almost argue, it could be argued, and it actually has been argued, um, that the reason the Reformation of the later Middle Ages, which again is actually my term, but the late medieval reform, why it, it didn't bring about a Reformation, or as I portrayed it, as why did it fail, was it did not have printing available. It did not have the means to reach a broad audience. And so we need to look at what has been called the printing revolution um, and a thesis by Elizabeth Eisenstein um, put forward that the, the printing was really the cause of the Reformation. And without printing um, and the, the revolution in printing, I should say, um, there would have been no Reformation. Now, that's probably um, going a bit too far, or overstating the, the position. But it's unquestionable that printing had a huge impact. And even if there may have been a Reformation in the 16th century without printing, it certainly would not have been what it was. Now, that said, we need to look a little bit um, in, in more detail about what this revolution was. Probably most of you, or many of you, if not, if not all of you, uh, have heard of Gutenberg and Gutenberg who developed for printing and everything else. But that is not technically correct. Uh, Johannes Gutenberg in Mainz um, was not the first to print a book. There were there was printing before Gutenberg. Uh, I have it there on the slide, uh, block print, uh, under the slide, the printing revolution. Block print um, did exist before Gutenberg. It was very costly and very labor intensive. What you would do, and it never really caught on because of the expense, if nothing else, but um, what you would do is you take a text um, that you wanted to print and get a block of wood. And you would carve that text of a single page onto that block of wood in reverse, or how, I'm not even sure how they do those things, but you know how it mirrors it. So you have to carve it into that in relief. Then you would ink it. And once you did that, then you could print it, put it on a, on a press and print, 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 print. So you could print 500 copies of that one page really quickly. Carving that block of that one page was very time consuming. And once it was done, what do you do with it? You, th you know, there's no, unless you want to print more copies. And then you have to turn to page two and do the same thing for page two, page three. So a, a, a treatise of, let's say, uh, 100 p pages would take a hundred blocks. Now, an aspect of block print continued for quite a long time, and something called woodcuts. 
and I'll be talking a fair amount about woodcut shortly. But that block printing was there, even though, again, very, not very often, um, very infrequently, it was very expensive. So it was not an effective and cost-effective means of distributing text. Text had always been copied. We can see, um, let's say, writing technology, uh, technology of information in a broad sense. In the early Christian period, we see a transition. It's called from roll to codex, um, as, as people have written about it. But the old scrolls had been the primary form of preserving text, of writing on a text and rolling it up in, on a roll. You unroll it, and there you got it on, on parchment. Not on parchment, but on um, papyrus often. Um, and it's been argued that a codex, which is just the Latin for book, you say, well, Libra is a word for Latin word for book. Yeah, but a codex is the physical thing. Um, that's important still for referring to things. And codicology is the study of books. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit in a second, because Libra actually does mean book, but not codex. Um, I know this is all of a sudden, it's like, I got to explain this to make sense. Sorry about this. This is a digression, but um, early Christian literature, a lot of medieval literature is itself, uh, one work is divided up into books, which are like long chapters. So this gets at really just organization of a text. And so like Augustine's Confession is 13 books. Um, those were individual sections. They're somewhat lengthy. Um, and it's only later than the individual chapters were given. Same thing with his City of God. Same thing with, with everything. In classical literature, is different books. So the term liber, which means book, um, was what we would think of as a chapter. And only later then did chapters... Uh, was a book divided into chapters, but a work was divided up into different books. Uh, it could be just one book. So you have the book and the codex would be the same, or it could be several books or two books and, you know, and everything else. Um, but the codex was the work as a whole. Okay. Um, that was a development, as has been argued, of, of Christian authors and Christianity turning the, the, a text from a roll, uh, from a scroll to a codex. Um, think of this easier if you have a, you know, a relatively small book, boom, codex, carry that around. It's easier than scary, carrying around a roll and you get it out. So there's a whole technology there. And then this printing, um, effective printing, was another uh, revolution in information technology. And that was the case, and there's developments within that. Um, the next real revolution in information technology then is the computer, the personal computer. And that has been huge. Um, some of you probably, um, uh, having re read, I know your, your self introductions, um, some of you certainly will be, uh, know what life was like before the, the personal computer and smartphones and everything else. Um, often my students look at me and like when I tell them that I began graduate school using a typewriter and they look at me like I'm some, you know, person from an, another planet or something, uh, or something that's like, how, how old are you? Um, but that has been, had a huge effect. And then, you know, the point of this is not to talk about the impact of the computer and, and smartphone technology and World Wide web and everything. And even worse, you know, social media and the impact of that on society, which is, it's had its positives in my view, but also has significant negatives. That has been a, a real revolution in how information is spread, disseminated, discussed. Um, and so we've had these kind of three big revolutions, the change from, you know, scroll to codex, the change from, you know, print uh, or from manuscript to print, and then to computerized, digitalized technologies. Before print, everything had to be copied by hand. 
Um, and that causes problems. I could go into the whole issue of manuscript culture, um, but it's something that I've spent a fair amount of time studying and doing and dealing with and still do and for my work, because most of the works I deal with are manuscripts. Um, and then manuscripts become sometimes become printed, and we can see it, it becomes very fascinating for me anyway. Um, uh, transition. The whole point of this, though, is to see the impact of this new technology. What was this to new technology? What actually did Gutenberg discover and do? Because in 1455, Gutenberg publishes what's been called the his 42 line Bible, um, and his innovation was not print as such, but it was called movable type. Now I mentioned the block print. What movable type is, is that instead of carving out an entire page, you carved out individual letters on little pieces, like, I don't know how exactly how they did it, take a block and then, you know, A, uh, uppercase A, lowercase A, uppercase B, and, and all the punctuation marks and anything else you might want to have on a page, and then you have to cut it so there's little pieces of type. If for those of you who do know what a typewriter was, and here I'm not even talking not about an electric typewriter, but um, uh, the old manual typewriter, which is what I used in college, um, with the you, know, you press the key and the arm go ding ding to actually hit the page. If you look at it, it's a long arm with a piece of type on it, and that is what's inked with the ribbon, and it hits the page. That's the same thing as what Gutenberg did, basically. Except you have these individual pieces of type or individual keys on the typewriter. And then you could rearrange them. There's something called a form, which was like large page type of thing. And it was had bars all through it. And so you'd arrange the type on the bars. And that was called composition. So a compositor would have their the text that they were going to print, a manuscript copy of the text they were going to print. They look at it and then they would take it from their tray of, of type. They would have to put it all in to, so it all worked out. Then you print it or, or ink it. Then you put it on the press and boom, 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 you do your 500 copies. But instead of having to throw away the whole block, you simply take off the type, turn the page, recompose it for the next page. And then boom, 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 boom. All of a sudden, with this innovation, printing becomes time effective and cost effective. That was what Gutenberg did. Even as um, remnants of previous book production continued, the earliest um, uh, printed books was called the Inconobula. Uh, books in the cradle period of printing, which goes from basically 1455 with Gutenberg's 42 line Bible until um, January 1st, 1501, Any, or actually December 31st, uh, 1500, because of, uh, that any book published before before January 1st, 1501 is part of the Inconobula uh, period of, of print. Uh, a book that was published on January 1st, 1501, is simply an early modern printed book. If you're a book collector, um, if you have a book that was published December 31st, 1500, that is far more valuable than a book that's published uh, on January 1st, 1501. So, okay, that's fine. Um, uh, for, for the user, it's not any different in some ways. Um, it is an issue of, of book pr production and book collection. It's a designation, Econobula. But it took, oh, this new technology took a, a lot of time to, to catch on. The earliest books are, uh, the type itself was simply trying to copy handwritten letters. 
because it wanted to look as close to a manuscript as possible, because that was what the status was. Now we can go into the whole thing of paleography and different, it's called late medieval or medieval hands, uh, the, the formal hands, the book hands that were written very clearly and formally. Um, and then there was you know, the individual um, hands of people, of scribes who would be taking notes for themselves or copying a text just for themselves. So there's a huge range of types of writing. Um, you can think of it today if you want to, if, you know, your, you know, the, the writing that a, a doctor fills out, writes out a prescription for, compared to someone who is taking calligraphy, um, in a course, calligraphy, beautiful handwriting, and that was the same thing back then. And you would learn, scribes would learn to write in different hands, as they were called. And I'm like this is not a course in medieval paleography, um, but some of this is, is the background. But the earliest printed books tried to imitate formal book hands, as they were called, so that it had the same level of prestige. And then they would still have what's called illuminations. Uh, they would leave places for big capital letters that then would be hand painted in. They would, what's called the rubrics, often capital letters throughout the text would be hand painted or at least painted over or through. Um, titles might be um, painted, they might them open and paint them the title so there was this mixture there and then illustrations something called the woodcut if you wanted to have a picture it used to be that there were manuscripts that were produced with beautiful artwork called uh, you know mini miniatures um, actually beautiful artwork uh, then the woodcut took over the woodcut would be images or pictures carved into a block that could maybe you know be included some uh, often within the the composition in that form just instead of on one line a bar it might take up you know three lines so you have one a picture here and boop 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 or it could be a picture the whole thing and then text underneath all kinds of creative ways to do things and that wood block picture that wood cut would have to be you know you can only use it for the printing um, so everyone is different and unique, but also just the skill of doing that artistically, to me, is, is mind-boggling. Um, some of the great artists we think of, you know, Albrecht Dürer was a great one for woodcuts, Louis Cranach, some of the, the great early German medieval, late medieval Reformation artists did woodcuts. It's their major artistic uh, productions, too, that often went along with published texts. <sighs> Printing never really caught on wide scale until the Reformation. So in many ways, we could say that just as printing made the Reformation, so did the Reformation make printing. And this transition from manuscript to print um, was, again, a, a slow process, but it took you know, maybe 50 years. Humans are resistant to change. I mean, I'm just, you know, projecting my own resistance. I mean, it took me um, a while before I got a computer. I got a computer uh, toward in the middle of my first semester in graduate school and didn't even want to deal with it until you know, over Christmas break. So I started my, you know, my first semester in graduate school and my papers I did on my manual typewriter. Um, and I was kind of afraid of it. And it's like this weird new thing. It's like freaky. Uh, and I still have that kind of attitude that's there with technology as such. But the point is that, that the market for texts, as a result of the controversies that were brewing, became increasingly large. And there began to be, you know, booksellers. There had been booksellers um, in the Middle Ages, university um, booksellers and things. And I can go into that. It's a whole long issue. But an, a, a whole genre of printed material grew up that was designed for widespread dissemination, which you really couldn't do with manuscripts. There can be multiple copies, and some of the um, very popular texts we have in 800, 900 extant manuscripts, that's huge. Essentially, a, a medieval text that is extant today in 20 manuscripts or more is considered to have been basically a bestseller. Um, so it's a whole nother um, 
scale of production that we're getting and we're talking about printing and talking about you know because you can do 800 copies printing very easily um, copying 800 making 800 copies of a book by hand is another issue um, so the whole market and book market is being transformed and book fairs are being are established um, and I mentioned Carl Stott went to purchase the Oprah Omni of Augustine that was one of the early editions that came out I think the first edition was at Frobe and it was like 1508 or 1509 I, forget, I should know these things off the top of my head and I'm not quite sure um, uh, I forget the precise date but, but it's like 1508 or 59 but at the, the book fair the Erasmus is an edition I think it's 1516 so it's it was available is my point so he could go and buy you know the eight volumes or nine volumes of uh, of the, the 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 Oprah Omnia the Ammerbach edition was first and then Ammerbach and then Froben Froben was with Erasmus anyway but that's another issue and it soon began to be seen as an effective means of spreading the word. And this new genre of literature became known as uh, Flugschriften. Flugschriften is German, um, and it literally means flying writing. Uh, in English, they're usually referred to as pamphlets. A technical definition of a pamphlet is a... Um, cost-effective or relatively cheap um, printed work of between two pages and 200 pages. That's a big mar uh, uh, spectrum. Um, so you can have a book of, of 180 pages being seen as a flugschrift, meaning it was for widespread dis dissemination, uh, produced relatively cheaply, so it would be relatively inexpensive, um, to maximize the circulation. Now, a printing of one sheet is called a broad, broad sheet. So we have broad sheets, and then we have pamphlets, or flugschriften, or flug, a flugschrift. Much of Luther's works were disseminated as pamphlets, from sermons to his treatises, and on we go. Um, and so these are works again, that by intent were to reach a, as broad an audience as possible. People were interested. Now, this whole issue with the spread of printing and the growth of printing and the, the market for printed works brings up the issue of literacy and orality, um, because what good is there to own a book if you can't read it? Um, and we could talk about that because there is some value and there's a market for people who would buy books and never read them, but that's a whole other issue. Um, so we're talking about literacy. We're talking about literacy rates um, within the empire, within the you know, early 16th century, um, which are very low. I don't have the, the statistics that you know, scholars have come up with approximated or estimated statistics in terms of the percentage of literacy, but the literacy doesn't really begin to take off until actually the 16th and 17th century. Uh, most people in Europe in the early 16th century were illiterate, which means they could not um, read or write Latin. The technical term at the time, also in the Middle Ages, um, also in classical antiquity, at least Latin classical antiquity, uh, the term illiterate, Ill illiterati, meant that you could not read or write Latin. Uh, so even if you could read or write early Ger German or early French or early Old English, um, if you couldn't read or write Latin, you were still considered to be illiterate. So it does make it a bit more difficult to know um, what the real levels of literacy were, especially when Luther starts publishing more and more in German. And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, but since there was this interest, texts could also be read. We know that they were uh, you know, in a pub. You know, if you're talking about, you know, what did Luther say today about the Pope? Isn't this great? You know, what did he say? Someone would have it and read it. What you know, the ninety-five thesis? What are these? Let me read it to you. And then with the translate with the translations in German, that increased it 
a little bit. And then we're talking still low levels of literacy. I think in the in the teens, if I had to guess at the moment, um, we're not talking about widespread literacy in society. But there's a combination of literacy and orality, whereby these texts would be read to people in groups. They would get to know them. That is a major means of distribution because there was an interest. Um, and I could go on about this. Uh, it's a long story behind all these things. And even in this early 17th century, actually a good friend of mine, who's uh, now at Luther College in Iowa, but we were graduates. Well, he was a lot younger than I was, but we were graduate students in the sense of he was you know, in his early stages as I was finishing up. But we were uh, together in Mainz for a year and uh, spent a lot of time together. Um, but he uh, was working for his dissertation on a controversy, Lutheran controversy, controversy in the early uh, 17th century. Where within, I think, I don't, I don't know why I'm spending your time and my time talking about this, but it's kind of fun. Um, I, I mentioned just in part one of this lecture with Melanchthon, the split between the, the Melanchthon, Melanchthon followers and the Nisio Lutherans, what was called the Philippus and the Nisio Lutherans. This was a controversy and a split within the Nisio Lutherans um, over a big controversy over original sin. And given um, Aristotle's philosophy and physics and anthropology and psychology and everything else, um, the debate was, was original sin uh, part of human substance, the substance of a human being, or was it an accident to human being? So they were called the substantivists and the accidentalists. And he said that, you know, it's fascinating because you have basically peasants in pubs arguing, coming to blows over whether you were a, a substantivist or an accidentalist. It's not necessarily that they understood even you know the, what those terms meant and certainly not what they meant for Aristotle in the philosophical, Aristotelian philosoph philosophical context, but it became a, a heated matter of, of debate in pubs in the local levels and it split communities. That was based on oral culture still, too, even though that oral debate was based on published texts and arguments. That's how I see that this literacy issue, literacy always goes together with orality. Just, you know, stories being told, also with literature, you know, stories would be read and told and memorized. Um, and the same thing with, with the early Reformation and the use of prints and, and the flu shrift and, and early Reformation. So we can't say that because there was, let's say, within the empire. And I think I'm probably pretty close. I could well, I'd have to go and look up the statistics um, to give you a more precise um, estimation. But let's say if we said in 15... Um, 22, if we said that there was a 12% literacy rate um, within um, the, the empire, within Saxony, that is probably, I, I, I'd be willing to bet, close to the, to the, the case. But that doesn't mean only 12% of the people could form the book market, because the interest in it, uh, when we combine the literacy with orality, became relatively large so that a lot of the population became very interested in these issues even if they couldn't read the actual text they probably knew someone who could in these kind of circles on the local level and that's how these things spread and formed the market and the demand which printers were always ready to meet because what do printers want to do make money so what are they going to print they're going to print what they think will sell was there ideological, theological, intellectual decisions behind some of the printing? Oh, yes, certainly there were. But also, as primarily, we need to sell. What will make a profit? What's the market? Back then, still today. We're talking about university presses that print the books that we, I mean, professional historians, right? Yeah, there's a quality control there for sure. There has to be. But it still comes down to what will sell. Um, and can we make a profit? That's the whole issue of academic publishing today is a whole other issue, which 
Happy to talk about, but that's getting, already getting us far away from the issue at hand, which is looking at the impact and role, those do, or the role and impact of, of printing and the spread of Reformation ideas and things. That being said, that is going on, and you know, the printing revolution is a whole kind of subfield of Reformation studies itself, or just cultural history of the 16th century, later 15th and 16th century. But it becomes a major means of Luther's movement, which again became known. I think I mentioned this before, but I'll do it again. Became the followers of Luther, the adherents of Luther, um, as either the Lutherani, which is usually. Uh, the term used by the opponents of Luther and his movement, those Lutherani Lutherans, or the evangelical. And that was really the term that was used, the evangelicals. Now, the evangelicals, I think I've said this before, um, but I'll say it again, this here, has nothing to do with what today is called the evangelicals. Uh, I'm not going to go into all that development, um, but we can't just say, oh, you know, I'm an evangelical, therefore that's what Luther was, or that's what the followers of Luther were. No. Um, evangelium in Latin is gospel. And Luther's call was for the preaching of the pure gospel. That's why it became known as the uh, evangelical movement, because it was the movement for the preaching of the pure gospel. So the evangelicals was more of the in-group term, the Lutherani was the ex, was the outgroup term, the opponents of the evangelicals. But still, even with everything I've said this far, all the developments that I've said this far, there were no such things as Protestants yet, unless we read back and apply a later term to this earlier development. They're all still working within this idea of we are making changes within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. No concept of we're breaking away from the church and starting a new church. That was inconceivable. I mean, Catholic, we have to keep in mind, meant universal. That's all it meant. There's no such thing as, quote unquote, Roman Catholicism until at least 1530, if not until 1545 or even later with Trent, but we'll get me getting into that. So Luther in 1525, even though he's getting married, is a good Catholic. Um, he's not a Roman Catholic because the whole concept of Roman Catholicism really didn't take hold. They are reformers, evangelicals, pushing for this evangelical program within the Catholic Church. They are schismatics and heretics from their opponents. The Lutherani, that's a way to discredit people, to give them a name and call them by the name of their founder, the, just like the Hussites. Those are, that's a, a almost derogative term because they're people following an individual human being rather than the gospel, rather than Jesus, rather than a monastic order. Now, Getting the word out, getting it spread. How does that come about? We have printing as the means, the medium. But what are the, some of the other um, strategies used when we go beyond this context of a, a university academic debate to changing society? How do you change people's views? How do you win people to your cause? And this brings me to the slide, Sola Scriptura, Image and Message. Um, because a tradition that goes back to Gregory the Great, uh, who supposedly made this statement that images or pictures are the Bible of the unlearned, of the illiterate. Medieval churches, from early medieval all the way through, you know, the great Gothic cathedrals that we no, and everything else to late medieval churches and to you know Luther's Wittenberg uh, Castle Church, all included images, stained glass, paintings, portraits, altarpieces, are all kind of bombarded with images of biblical stories of saints, 
of the Christian tradition. And preachers who are preaching in these churches could also often refer to these stories. Um, in the Cathedral Basel, when I was there, uh, in the old part of the 14th century part of it, you can still get through down underneath. The whole walls are covered with murals, and there was one uh, very impactful or moving one, uh, to me anyway. It was like, whoa, uh, kind of bringing the story home um, of you know Solomon and the two women with the child. Um, and here Solomon is, the picture is he's holding up the baby by one foot. He has a, you know, big knife in the hand about ready to split it. Um, and it's like, okay, the true mother is the one who said, go ahead, give it to the other one. Um, I mean, if you know the story, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, but when you see it, it's like, wow. So images impact our conscious mind still today. Just think about the images that we see on TV. Think of the images used for advertising. They're all trying to manipulate us, to get us to see things in a certain way, to associate an image with a message. Always has been the case. That's why you have these, you know, quote unquote, apparently gorgeous people, male and female, selling products. Because it's supposed to give you the sense of, oh, if I get one of these, maybe I'll be like that. Or maybe, you know, I can get somebody like that because I have one of these, whatever it might be. Think of the imagery. Next time you're watching TV, don't just watch or even stream with that wherever they have commercials. Or if you see advertisements in magazines or newspapers or billboards or whatever, think of the imagery and what it's intending to unconsciously communicate that was still being used or that was used in some ways for the first time with the reformation I mean, it has always been the case with images if we can manipulate the images that's there now the reason why this slide is called sola scriptura image and message is because this ties into one of the uh, Phrases that often is associated with Luther's Reformation position and everything else. Sola Scriptura. You'll see, oh, we have the, the Luther's Reformation. Luther's theology can be uh, encapsulized by sola fide, by faith alone. Sola uh, gratia, by grace alone, is sola scriptura, uh, by scripture alone. That often has been seen as Luther advocating for um, everybody being able to read the Bible for themselves. That was absolutely not Luther's position. And we can say, question even, what did Luther really mean by sola scriptura, especially when so many of his works were being published with images, with woodcuts. And that includes his translation of the Bible. Yeah. Luther's translation of the Bible I want to uh, start with. I have there the second major point of function of images. I have the books of the illiterate, which I've already kind of uh, mentioned, and then scatology, which I'll come back to. But I want to start this series uh, of next uh, section of slides anyway sola scriptura question mark image and message with looking at luther's bible and his translation as i mentioned luther started his translation of the bible uh in the vartpork uh it's apocryphal uh the uh the luther threw his inkwell at the wall the devil it is something that certainly luther could have done would have done may have done, but there's no evidence that that story it was historical, even though I, I've heard, I, I have not been to the Vart Board, actually. Um, I'm not, actually, I'm not sure if I have or not, because I've been to Wittenberg. Anyway, um, no, I haven't, I haven't been to the Vart Board, but I've been to Wittenberg. Anyway, um, but I've heard that, you know, you can 
go in and they, they show you the room where Luther was kept at the Bart Borg and supposedly there's still an ink you know, stain on the wall where he threw his ink well at the devil. That's definitely something Luther would do because he directly confronted the devil. I'll be talking about that in a minute when I get to scatology. So, um, But what did he mean by Sola Scriptura? When he's sitting there translating. I already mentioned that he would write back to... Uh, Wittenberg to Melanchthon asked for help with translations. Whatever you think of Luther, whatever you think in some ways of Christianity, Luther's translation of the Bible was a monumental achievement and had a monumental impact on the German language. Even um, Friedrich Nietzsche in the later 19th century highly praised Luther's translation. Uh, if you know anything about Nietzsche, you might not expect that, but it, it it began to have the same impact and influence on German society as the King James Version had on English society, because the King James Version, which doesn't come out until 1603, I think it is, or later, um, even later, um, well, it was much later, but Germans, uh, Luther's German translation set modern German. And I can talk a lot about the development of the German language um, uh, and how it all developed and how it became standardized. But it became a standard German, um, basically with Luther's translation as being the translation that was used. Um, and it was issued, especially in its later revisions and things, uh, with images. But even the, the September Testament, as it was called, 1522, um, which did not have images as such that I remember, um, but did just the, the image that you saw on the page made an impact. Now I have it there on the slide, medieval glosses. Um, the medieval Bible, both in manuscript form and then also as it was being printed, um, was always printed with medieval glosses. Now a gloss is a commentary on the text. There are two types. There's what's called the interlinear, interlinear, interlinear. I can't even pronounce this word right now. Darn it. Um, the the gloss between the lines, the interlinear uh, gloss. Um, so the, the, they had a printed text, and like above, it give an explanation of a given word. If there was a difficult word, it would say, you know, i.e., it asked, uh, and it would give an explanation of the word. It might give you know, a, a brief um, interpretation, um, but there relatively um, short comments within the lines of the text. That's an interlinear linear gloss. Then the marginal gloss would be all around the margins. The medieval glosses consisted primarily of passages from the church fathers and medieval theologians um, who were interpreting the same passage that you'd be reading. So that if you read a, a medieval Bible text, it would be um, like, here's the page, right? And the actual biblical text would be like here. There'd be glosses all around it, and then in a, in a linear glosses here. So you always read the, the the Bible with the gloss. Luther criticized the glosses. He says we got to get rid of these horrible glosses um, because they are taking away from the scripture alone, the scripture itself. All well and good in some ways. Glossa Ordinaria uh, is even like the standard biblical uh, production. It was a called the Glossa Ordinaria, which had the Bible with the gloss, the ordinary gloss, which was meaning what everybody knew. That was the development of the 12th and 13th centuries. Um, and we said we have to get rid of the, of the of these glosses. So I'm going to uh, do my translation of the Bible. I'm not going to, number one, I'm going to be doing it in German. Um, and number two, uh, I'm not going to include the, the glosses. And yet, Luther did include glosses. Luther, in his September Testament, 1522, included his own glosses. He got rid of the medieval glosses, but added his own marginal interlinear glosses. They're not nearly as extensive as the medieval gloss, but they are not insignificant, especially on, on like Romans, 
um, was the one with the most number of glosses in First Corinthians, I think, was the, had the second highest number of Luther glosses that are basically saying, this is how this passage is to be understood. He was telling people, this is what the text means. This is how you should interpret it. This is how you are to understand it. If he thought there was a, a place that was questionable. He also then, very interestingly, um, and there's a great book, Mark Edwards, um, what it's called, Printing, Print and Propaganda, or Print, something like that, uh, goes through all of this and gives and shows, um, uh, kind of reprints some of these pages. In the contents page uh, with Luther's Testament, we have then table of contents. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. But then there is, once we get to the Apocalypse or Revelations, there's a gap. And then there are, I think, three books. The letter to James. Hebrews. I think it's Jude, but I'm not sure. There's one other book that had been part of the New Testament that Luther then says, no. He translates them, but he gives them a lower stand, uh, status. He also doesn't say letter according to St. James. He does, you know, letter, uh, first letter of St. Peter, first letter, you know, second letter of St. Peter. Um, but down here, just this letter of James. He, we know from his other statements, he called the, the epistle of James a letter of straw and thought it should be thrown out of the canon. Luther's understanding of the Bible was not the same as a literal understanding. There was no such thing as, you know, just as a footnote in some ways, as fundamentalism until the 19th century. And Luther was in no way, shape, or form a fundamentalist in any way. His principle of biblical interpretation was based on what, uh, actually a, a humanist concept, going back to, to the classical concept, um, called the scopus scripturae. A scopus is like that, that thing that you look through, the, the scope, literally the scope, that is that key point of a text that is the key for interpreting all the texts. And once you kind of find that key part, that scopus, that allows you to understand all the rest of the text because you interpret the rest of the text in light of that scopus because that is what allows you to see what the text is really about. And for Luther, that scopus was passive righteousness. And in his breakthrough, he says, you know, I started going through all the scripture in my mind. Boom, it opened the door to me. Luther equated passive righteousness with the evangelium, the gospel. <coughs> Not one of the gospels, but the gospel, the good news, the evangelium, is passive righteousness for Luther. That is how the whole Bible should be interpreted. So James is like, that's a letter of straw. Let's get rid of it. So scripture alone is not the literal word of the Bible in any way, shape, or form. It is not um, without interpretation. Luther's view of sola scriptura meant that everyone should interpret the Bible as he did. I know the truth. I'm a professor of the Bible. I know what I found the scope of scripture. That's my big discovery. The scope of scripture, that key, the, the gospel behind all the gospels and all the other writings going all the way back to Genesis. If you interpret it differently, you're wrong. Because you're not doing it according to the scope of scripture, the scope of, of scripture. Luther certainly wanted everybody to read the Bible, to learn the Bible, to memorize the Bible, but to understand it and interpret it the way he was teaching you to. This idea that anybody could read the Bible for themselves and interpret it themselves, uh-uh. That has nothing to do with Luther's position. And it was his not only shock, but a source of his anger and animosity when other theologians started to disagree with him.
Interestingly enough, Luther has been called, uh, or was called at the time by his opponents, uh, both Protestant and Catholic opponents, um, the Pope of Wittenberg. Because what you're doing, if you throw out the papacy, what's the papacy? The papacy is like the Supreme Court. It's the last court of appeal. The papacy never said, no pope ever said, I alone can interpret scripture, as Luther accuses them of saying. What they said is that the papacy or the pope, when there is dispute, when there is academic dispute among theologians, that and if an, a, a question, a dispute, needs to be determined, only the Pope can determine it. It's a practical issue. Again, the Pope is the Supreme Court. If we get rid of the Supreme Court, what's going to happen to our society of law when there's dispute over what the Constitution means? And that's just on the theoretical basis. I'm not going into the practicalities of politics today, but that's, I think you can get the point here. Luther and everyone, everyone, anyone who broke away from Rome, as I'll be talking more about, once you get rid of that hierarchy of authority, you have a problem. Because what replaces it? And Luther was replacing it with his own interpretation. This gets to be, and there's always was tension within the medieval church. Um, there were very few, very few papal pronouncements on doctrine. Um, most of the, of the debates could continue as debates. There's also the issue of tradition. Because a text difficult to interpret. A text is damn difficult to interpret. How do you go about doing it? It's not what just you know what it means to me. If I just say, you know, I just read this text and I say, God, please tell me what it says. Well, fine, that may be true. God may be doing that for you. But you have to convince somebody else that that is what they're doing. And if someone else says, well, you know what? I read the same text, and God has told me that what you say is complete, you know, hooey. No, well, it's not hooey, because God told me that. That's conflict. How do we resolve that conflict? The papacy is up there. If there's an issue of mysticism, we're going to talk a lot about mysticism. I don't have time right now. We'll come back to it a little bit when we come to the Radical Reformation, if I even included lectures on the Radical Reformation, because mysticism and dissent is, is an issue. But there had always been you know, recognition of individual revelations to mystics. Um, that's part of the Christian tradition itself, that God speaks to people. So you can't deny that. You know, the institutional hierarchy cannot deny that God speaks to people. Um, the problem is, though, if someone claims that God has done so, how do you prove it? That had been always the issue. So there's this tension, always had been, between individual mystical divine experience and divine revelation and the institutional determination. Same thing is there with the Svikau prophets, as I mentioned, for Melanchthon. And Luther is saying, test the spirits. And throughout, as the movement grows and develops and splinters over conflicting interpretations that Luther thought was horrendous. He thought it was the work of the devil. Sola Scriptura is simply the principle that if we're going to debate a theological interpretation or principle, we have to do so based on the text itself, not on the interpretive traditions of the church. Can we use them? Of course we can use them. We can use Augustine, certainly. Um, a lot of the medieval theologians um, Luther didn't think that much of and didn't really know anything about. He hadn't read very much, actually. Um, but the basis is not what tradition. So in some ways, 
Luther at Worms, what is kind of radical about Luther at Worms over against Charles is Charles V is saying, you know, how can a thousand years of tradition be wrong? And Luther says very easily because they're getting the, 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 they're not understanding it correctly. I am. And the point is scripture alone, not what the tradition is saying. There's two different approaches to scriptural interpretation, textual scholarship, textual criticism, textual understanding, and textual interpretation that was an issue here. And that is what the sola scriptura meant for Luther. The issues of theological controversy or debate or teaching, scripture is the, 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 the basis for it, not the tradition. But scripture, as I said from Luther, he knew what the correct interpretation was because he had discovered the, the scope of scripture. And if you don't see that, you're an idiot for Luther. Now, that's that aspect. And I spent a lot um, more time on this than I had planned. But the issue then is, especially with uh, some of the further editions of Luther's translation in the 1530s and 1540s. Um, his first, I think, I forget exactly when his the first complete Bible is uh, of Luther's translation comes out. I think it's in, in 35 or something like that. Uh, woodcuts are added. Woodcuts of pictures. Such as with the book of Revelation. There's a woodcut, a very famous woodcut. And uh, footnote i'm about ready to show you some woodcuts and some images um i'm not sh sure i think i may have one from the from the, his translation of the bible but i'm not sure um i have more um actually slides uh, that i can show show in my uh if I, when i teach this per course in person but it was kind of difficult so these are only i only have a few examples to show but i think they will get the the point across um, but one of the images uh, that is, goes along with Luther's uh, translation um, of one of the later editions of it in the book of, of Revelation is the Horror of Babylon. And here's the Horror of Babylon coming on in on this three-headed beast. And the Horror of Babylon is, as you can think of, oh, voluptuous female. The beast, the three-headed beast, Every head of the beast has a papal tiara on it. The papal tiara is the papal crown. It is, and so does the Horror of Babylon. It is associating the papacy with the Horror of Babylon. That is a, makes a huge impact if you're reading this and hearing it and seeing it at the same time. And that's not the only image that goes along with Luther's translation. Certainly not the only image that goes along with some of other uh, Luther's works that are spread as flugschriften designed for fast, wide distribution. And images can make an impression and send a message even to those who can't read a text. So if you're in a circle and I'm re telling you what this text is saying, saying, look at the pictures, it's like, whoa, it makes it fit. And there's a whole technology with images and text and message that um, is there from early on in the person of my Augustinians that I study, uh, Jordan Quenenborg, uh, in my view, had a significant role to play in the development of that, which some of his works, um, but that kind of takes us too far afield for this. Anyway, that's the point. How do we get this across? Now, I'm going to show you some images, as I said, both um, Protestant images, and I'll later talk more about Protestantism, but um, so some of these are not Protestant, but they're from the evangelical camp, from Luther's camp, um, to get the message out. Uh, and then some Catholics. Now, the Catholics were kind of um, slow to respond, or the Roman Catholics, or the opponents of Luther, however you want to, to term them, were slow to respond to this early Lutheran evangelical campaign. The, you know, later talk about it as a propaganda campaign. Um, but they did finally kind of join in. So I'll show you some couple of, of Catholic images too. But as a preface here, not only the function of images, which I've been talking about all along, uh, but in, in the books of the illiterate, which I've already referred to, but scatology. Um, 
because some of these images they'll be showing like kind of graphic and it's kind of fun and they'll really get the, the message across um and this i could spend a lot of time on this too and i know this i've already spent too much time uh, on part two of this lecture i don't want to have to go to part three so i'm going to get through this kind of as, as quickly as possible uh which is really too bad but um scatology is basically dealing with feces um Luther, as traditionally interpreted, was seen in his older age to become rather crude and rude, using vulgar language, um, and on we go. Again, my teacher, Obermann, uh, this is where I do follow his approach, said, you know, that's the, the old man Luther thesis is, is not viable whatsoever because Luther was crude and rude from the very beginning. And Luther, and Obermann, pointed to the sermon that he gave in 1512. So he just became a doctor of theology, but he's giving it to the, the, uh, the, the other Augustinian hermits in Wittenberg. And he's talking about the devil. He says, you know what? The devil will come to you at night. And the devil will say, look at you, you monk. You think you're so pure and clean. Well, you know what? You're actually covered in shit. And Luther says, and when the devil does that, there's only one response. And that response is, yes, devil, I am covered in shit. But it's your shit I'm covered in. And you can come and eat your own shit. And that's the only means to fight the devil. Yeah, that's, yeah, I hope I don't bother anybody the fact that I wear the, use the word shit instead of poop, but it doesn't have the same, or feces or excrement, doesn't quite have the same impact, uh, also in terms of the German that you that, that Luther used. But that was not beginning with Luther. There's late medieval examples of this as well, um, using bodily processes to attack your opponents. And or simply to make jokes. I mean, still, you know, poop is funny. Um, you know, little kids today, poop, oh, it's funny. It's, you know, we still laugh. We're so prim and proper. We don't laugh at poop or pee anymore. But no, it's funny. Um, and I'm not going to go into the psychology of why that's there. I'm not even sure. But there are, you know, humanist writings who are trying to denigrate their so-called scholastic opponents and they're using scatology to do so. Scatological language. So this is not something that is new. This is just something of the culture. Um, but that's kind of the point here. I just wanted to talk about that in terms of seeing and realizing the function of scatological language, and especially with Luther, which he references it to the devil. I think I may have mentioned too, in terms of um, Luther's theological breakthrough of passive righteousness and the so-called tower experience that Obermann said that, you know, he, when Luther says you know, that he had this discovery in hot cloaca on the toilet, for, for Obermann, that meant Luther was actually saying, I'm sitting on the toilet taking a dump. That's when I had it. Uh, and it's not the, the psychological kind of Freudian analysis that Erickson, Eric Erickson gave it, um, but that's a whole other issue because Erickson was far more sophisticated than, than, than uh, he's often uh, given credit for. Um, but that's very much more real than the kind of pious Luther. No, Heiko, Luther was sitting behind his desk because in hot cloaca refers to his office. He was studying the scriptures. He wasn't going to the bathroom. For Luther, it's like, you know, God comes to us in those places. And if we can't acknowledge that, if we can't, you know, realize that we don't have to clean up ourselves for God, we're missing the whole point. So it's a theological point that Heike was trying to make about Luther and the young Luther as well. So I'm going to put that in co in context as I'm going to show you these very much some of them, a couple some of very cartoon esque um, woodcuts dealing with scatological images uh, and how effective it could be in getting the message out.
So we first start then with Protestant woodcuts. And here I'm just going to go these through these real quickly. You can look, go back and look at them kind of on your own time because I know I'm running out of time here. Um, here's an early uh, depiction of Luther um, as an Augustinian hermit. There he is in his habit with his tonsure. Uh, and this, I think, dates from 1520 or 21. Um, so in terms of, again, the image of Luther... And when he becomes the reformer, he's still being portrayed as an Augustinian hermit in 1520, 1521. That's the point I want to make instead of this whole bombast. Um, Luther, is the, now he's rejected everything. Keep the, that image in mind. And the next one, too, is I think it's definitely a 1523 right here. Here's 1523. This is Luther with his doctor's cap. That's what that is. But yet still in his monastic habit, as you can see. And there's that light behind him. And what is that? That is what is called a nimbus or a halo. He's be, being portrayed as this saint who is the doctor of the Holy Scripture as an Augustinian hermit. 1523. That's what's there. That's the image that's trying to get across. But it's not just the image of Luther. Um, in 1521 or 22, and 22, 1521, actually, I think, Melanchthon, uh, together with printers and you know artists who did the woodcuts, I'm not sure who did the woodcuts here, wasn't this is not chronic, um, uh, or Durer, published a work called the Passionale Christi und Antichristi, or the Passion of Christ and Antichrist, and it goes through uh, a number of scenes from Christ's life. Uh, in Christ's Passion, uh, which is a Christ's Passion was a very big issue. That's where Jordan comes in. That's a whole other issue, which I would love to talk about, but don't have the time here. We're actually in the confines of this course at all, really. Um, but it's contrasting two things. If you look at this woodcut, if you're looking at your computer screen on the left, you'll see the scene of Jesus casting out the money changers from the temple. On the right, you see the Pope um, collecting money from letters of indulgences. So these are the people who are coming to buy letters of indulgences. Um, and then on the left, then Christ is whipping them out. And there's a number of contrasting scenes like that throughout the work. Which makes it very clear, even if you can't read a word. I mean, Melanchthon provided very um, short text to go along with it. But even if you couldn't read that, you could see the pictures. And the point becomes very clear. Because you know what th these figures are. There's no nobody at the time would have seen that picture and said, the, the, the guy on the left, who is that? Or the, the guy on the right, what's going on there? It's clear. This is known. This is experience and lived through. Um, okay, then, and this is where we get into some of the more fun images. Here we have uh, an image of the devil. And this is an image that was going along with Luther's works. And I forget if this particular one was part of, of um, his uh, New Testament. I don't think, I think it was some of his other works. But if you look at this image, you see this pretty hideous looking Thing is the devil with his mouth wide open. Um, really kind of disgusting here. But if you look kind of closely, being flown right into the devil's mouth is that little figure with the tiara, papal tiara, and holding the key. That's the Pope. That is like what the Pope uh, is going to happen to the Pope. He's going to end up in the devil's mouth. Or here we have another one um, of. Again, the Pope, this is the devil with his mouth wide open, kind of a combination of, of teeth and flames and everything else. If you look closely, um, the Pope is actually sitting enthroned within the devil's mouth. Uh, and there's demons all over the place there too, but the Pope, if you kind of look straight ahead, kind of go straight up for a while, um, you, you can kind of make out that figure with his hands kind of together. Uh, and there's kind of... Uh, playing with the tiara around him that's the pope and that's what um the pope really is that too makes its impression then here you are if you want to have problems um with the 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 pope and want to express your problems so you don't want to write you can just bend over and fart in the pope's face that's what these two peasants are doing 
Um, and the Pope is sitting there in all the splendor with a couple of cardinals on the side. And there's a couple of peasants, you know, pulling down their pants and farting, which is all the wonderful, you know, cloud coming out. Um, if you can see it, those farting in the Pope's face. Or if that's not going to work, here's another one. You can just take a big dump in the papal tiara itself. Now, there are a lot of fun images like that. Um, and uh, I wish I could show you more. I wish I had more. If Again, if this were an in-class uh, or in-person um, class, I, I would be showing you more. There's a great book by Robert Scribner um, called For the Sake of Simple Folk, uh, which goes through um, a, a lot of these images, uh, and certainly not exhaustively, but a lot of more of the images that some of these I've taken from him as well. So if you're interested, you can just, you know, we have it in the library. Uh, so it would be a rush to the library to get Robert Scribner for the sake of simple folk. Uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, anyway, fantastic work. Those are the, the Protestant ones. And again, I'm used Protestant somewhat carefully because as I will be t talking about, um, I think the next lecture, Protestant is a technical term, doesn't, uh, come into being until 1529. We'll get there when we get there. But then the Catholic side, I said, is later, probably gets into the, the, the fray, and also tries to discredit Luther. And here is Luther as the devil's bagpipe. And this is the only color, um, colored image I have here. Um, and so that also gets the image and the message across that Luther is just being you know, a spokesperson or a bagpipe for the devil. That makes a point, or a very famous woodcut. I mean, this is a famous one too, but another famous woodcut, um, the seven head of Luther. Um, and that is what the, this next image is with Sibum Quipfel Martin and Luther, so the seven heads of Luther. Um, and it just shows it's a monster. That's what it is. Like this person is everything from a complete wacko monster um, who tries to be too much and everything else. Uh, from a you know a, a doctor, a monk, a prince, and a uh, ecclesiastic. Uh, it's like this is monstrous, and that's what Luther is. Um, there also is a great woodcut that is in Scribner's book, um, but I did, wasn't able, don't have an image of it here to be able to include on the slides here. But it's called Luther Vine Suck. Luther as kind of a wine sack, a drunkard, um, and it shows Luther kind of all dressed as a peasant with this huge belly that he has to carry in a wheelbarrow. Um, and then he's, of course, married to a nun. And so there's a picture of, of Katie still in her nun's habit. Luther is no longer in his you know, hermit's habit, but Katie is still in her nun's habit. And they have kids all over themselves. And there's like a drunk competitor with Luther, um, which also gets the point across. It's a war of images as well as a war of words or was for the consciousness of Europe, for the consciousness of Christendom, as things are falling apart. And what side are you going to be on? If you remember when I talked about the reformation of the Emperor Sigismund, 15th century, and when it ended with this prophecy of this reformer will come, this reformer Frederick will come. Impose reformation, like be ready, be on his side, because if you're not, there'll be problems. And yet, we also have Hans, uh, Hans Luther's, Luther's warning to his son, having you also heard Martin, that the devil can appear as an angel of light. In some ways, that was the debate with these images. What image are you going to get across this holy, saintly, instrument of God, Luther, and what was going on, or this diabolical image of Luther being played by the devil. How do we know what's going on? Okay, now, Reformation is the first mass media event, social image and advertising and propaganda. Um, and in so many ways it was, because when we look at the um, just the statistics of the numbers of prints. We can kind of see this rise of printing is going here, 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 and all of a sudden it's going, ooh, and it really takes off with the Reformation and Luther, just in terms of the sheer numbers. Number one. Number two, Luther dominated the media. He dominated what was being printed. I think over 70%. In, I guess, 
in general. Sometimes it may, some years it may have been higher, some lower, and everything else. But approximately seventy percent of what was being printed in the fifteen twenties and thirties was works of Luther. That is astounding. Think of you know a politician today. If you said you know, hey, if you come um, follow what I tell you to do, you can will end up with seventy percent of the media attention. It's pretty good. That is the impact of all of this. It is changing people's minds. Also, with all this, both as what is the, the text and the image working together, not only do I make the statement here with the you know, Reformation as the first mass media event, but also as propaganda is the first real uh, piece of propaganda, a propaganda event since actually the Augustan Revolution with Caesar Augustus. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in my Western Civ course, but he really initiated this propaganda movement to change the minds and the hearts and the understandings of Romans who had been fierce Republicans to accepting him as uh, an emperor and a dictator. And that is what the same kind of thing had to happen with Luther and his followers and supporters is we have to transform people's minds and understandings, not just based on the word of God, yes, not just to teach them theologically what's different, yes, but just how they perceive their consciousness, their way of viewing the world, we have to change. How do we go about doing that? It's not just the intellect. And propaganda simply means that which is to be spread. That which is to be spread, propaganda, to be spread. And in some ways, we think of propaganda as, oh, it was mind-washing, as, you know, Nazism. Um, and that's because Hitler had a very clearly articulated program of propaganda, and Josef Goebbels was kind of responsible, and Goebbels was a brilliant man. He may have been absolutely vile and disgusting and everything else, but he was brilliant. And his theory of propaganda was this. Keep the message short. Keep it memorable and make it memorable and repeat it over and 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 over again we still follow gerbils some ways that's simply the theory of propaganda from augustus through luther and um, the evangelicals all the way through up through hitler up through today it is that approach and it had its effect because people were getting the message people were getting the um desire to to go along and to break from rome and whether this was simply because people read luther and felt you know what he's right um, now we're going to break from Rome or whether it was because of like, oh, especially in more urban develops so or the princes that would be following him um, because this is good for me. I can get something out of this or because this is the gospel truth that now I see that it's the gospel truth or whatever reasons it was having its impact. And a number of German princes were following and supporting Luther and increasingly imperial free cities were following Luther. Now, these were imperial free cities, I think I mentioned them in an earlier lecture, who had received a charter from the emperor to be independent from their feudal overlords. They already had this tradition of governing themselves. And they started coming together in the, with the city councils to vote on introduction, introducing the Reformation, inter, the introduction of evangelical reforms to say, okay, we are going to do this. We are going to establish preacherships for the preaching of the pure gospel. We are going to start implementing measures of reform and reforming how you know, the mass is done or whatever. And so we have this movement among cities, which also includes artisans. Now, artisans are technically peasants in the uh, three order scheme. They're not nobles, they're not clergy. So they're peasants, they work, but they are educated, they're a higher degree of education. There's a higher degree of literacy in the towns and the cities and the imperial free cities, especially, which allows for this movement. And so we have, you know, it's this is not sending out um, 
you know, pamphlets to the countryside. This is within the urban context. And so we, you know, it's been said that the Reformation was an urban event. Because that's how it spreads, word of mouth. And there are, these are almost power centers as well. And we need to come to realize that the introduction of the Reformation within the cities was a political decision with many different motivations and dynamics and components to think about, consider, and take into account. It's not simply Luther was right. Or it's not simply we hate Rome. Look at how you know corrupt they are. It was not simply look what the Holy Spirit is doing. Far more was involved. And to really come to an understanding of how this movement, this development that started kind of as a powder keg that the 95 Theses lit the spark to explode. How did it all come about? What were the was the impact of that explosion? And how was it going to develop further? And that is where I'm going to stop here um, and continue in uh, the second lecture for week two. Um, because this is really getting at the heart of what was happening historically in the 16th century. And we can't say it's one or the other. We can't say that cities introduced the Reformation simply because um, uh, for their own political benefit. Was it also a theological, religious decision? Yes. Was it also a political division? Yes. Was it also a, a, a social decision? Yes. All of these were all together. That's what makes it so complex to understand and to try to unravel and any attempt to reduce it to one single cause or one single dynamic is an ahistorical, whether it be a social interpretation or a political interpretation or a theological interpretation. We can't understand the Reformation unless we understand the theology. We can't understand the Reformation unless we understand the social dynamics and the political dynamics and the economic dynamics. That's what we're trying to do because it's those, all of those components and dynamics together that would transform Europe and bring Europe from medieval forms to forms that scholars refer to as early modern. This is just the beginning, in some ways. Even though we're kind of at the halfway point, sort of. Anyway, thank you for your patience. Um, I'll continue from uh, here with the second lecture for this week. Um, and I'll try to get it all together in one part rather than breaking it up and going on for so long as I have here. But I, this was an important um, lecture for you to understand what is really the dynamics that are going along with from Luther to the Reformation um, as, as a larger movement. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye.